I am Harsha from Los Alamos. Thank you so much for the organizing committee of Jump Dev for giving me this opportunity uh, to present to this kind of a very perfect audience. Uh, so it's a global non-convex MinLP solver. So I guess this is probably one of the first or very few talks on global optimization in this workshop, I suppose. Uh, I would like to thank all the postdocs and our group which has uh, worked on this project. My acknowledgments also to Jeff Lindroth. All right, so outline. Uh, I'll be talking about a quick introduction to Minal piece, which we all know already, but then I just thought it'll be just a wholesome presentation to have it. And a quick introduction to spatial branch inbound approach, which is what is implemented in most of the solvers. I'll be looking at uh, discussing piecewise convex relaxations or formulations to be able to handle an alternative approach for a spatial branch inbound. And uh, Based on this, I'll be discussing a global optimization algorithm, which uh, has some novel ideas based on partitioning and how to be partitioned, how to be prune, and uh, there are some interesting ideas which I'll be discussing there. And in the end, I'll discuss the solver features and uh, the potential future directions. So if any of you have some suggestions and improvements, we are more than happy to collaborate and uh, discuss. I'll be here till tomorrow so we can pursue some directions. All right, so a generic mineral P basically has uh, an objective function and set of constraints which can be either nonlinear, non-convex or linear. It can be basically a combination of these and also subset of constraints can be equality and inequality. We assume that there is a set of variables which are integers. For this presentation purpose, let's just assume that they are binary, but uh, we are working and looking at extensions for integer variable formulations. Manual piece have appeared in many applications, especially since uh, in this era of machine learning, I thought I should have this at least one slide where it talks about a little bit of machine learning where people are looking at maximizing or minimizing or finding the saddle points in high dimensional non-convex optimization problems. And then these are modeled as mixed integer nonlinear programs. In addition to these, there are many classic applications which are in infrastructure networks like power systems, gas pipeline networks, chemical process networks where some problems and like pooling and blending problems appear as mineral piece in these applications and also the molecular structure completion. So this is no way an exhaustive set but just a few applications which uh, motivate why mineral piece are important. So in Los Alamos we have been mostly focusing on the top two applications which are the power systems and gas pipeline networks and also some of the machine learning problems in our group. So that was also partly the motivation why we started looking at these problems. Okay, so here is a quick classification of the problems. We all know what this figure means here. Uh, I, the reason I had this figure was because I wanted to demonstrate something which was really the intuition why we started looking at this approach. So here we can assume that green to red, the problem becomes harder in this uh, classification of problems. So basically the problems can be mainly classified based on linearity and nonlinearity and the existence of discrete variables versus continuous variables. So based on this, as we know, given an integer linear program or a mixed integer linear program, a typical way to solve this is to solve a sequence of linear programs and apply branch and bound approach and to obtain the optimal solution for that MILP. If the problem is nonlinear and convex, it's still not too bad, assuming that SDP doesn't lie in that list, but it depends what size of SDP you're looking at. For now, let's assume that that's an easy box. That's why I kind of highlighted in a slightly darker green than the linear programs. If the problem becomes convex and still if it is mixed integer NLP, then the problems are still hard just because of the fact that it contains some discrete variables. And typically people apply either outer approximation approaches and try to migrate towards the integer linear program and solve a sequence of these. If the problem is non-convex, typically the way to solve this problem is to divide the regions into multiple sub-regions, apply convex relaxations, come to this box, and then to be able to solve this box. So this is a classic spatial branch and bond approach where people have been looking at for ages and there are many solvers which do this approach. There is also another approach, which is basically the mill based method for solving a non-convex optimization problem where any non-convex problem can be solved using a sequence of integer linear programs. So now obviously the question is, you know, we know that ILPs are already hard to solve, but then why look at ILP? The reason is because there has been quite an improvement in the MILIP software in like last few years. Uh, I mean, few decades, I should say. So the algorithms and machines have become at least this much faster. And uh, MILP, which would take 124 years in 1988, would take a second today to solve it. So solving a MILP is not as difficult as it is uh, 
uh, thought about. So we thought, let's basically take this approach of just solving MILPs using these state-of-the-art solvers and see how we can approach the global optimization. So this is uh, kind of the main overview of the thing. So getting into the slight details of the problem, here are some of the state-of-the-art global solvers. I think I have missed K-Nitro, which I did not know until I attended the talk yesterday because I thought it was more like a local solver, but then we can, we can consider adding that to this list of comparisons. But uh, the real state-of-the-art solvers are like Baron, Antigon, Lindo, API, and these are the two open-source solvers, which are QIN and Skip. It's global? Minotaur, yeah. Oh, okay, Minotaur, yeah. So... Yeah? Jeff. Jeff's involved in that, right, right. I'm sure like, we can add like few more solvers to this list, but uh, we just could not make uh, all the comparisons because we were constrained with jump and modeling language. So most of these solvers are basically based on the spatial branch and board approach, where the idea is pretty simple, excluding a lot of bells and whistles of these solvers. Given a non-convex function, it's the, within this given domain for the simple example of one-dimensional function. So it's about basically taking the function, finding the best upper bound of the function, Apply convex relaxation, get a lower bound, evaluate the gap. If this gap is within certain user-defined precision, we are done. We have the global optimum for the problem. Else, we do the spatial branching on that particular variable. Assuming that we branch at the origin in this particular case, basically we have these two, per, the two separate regions and we build separate convex relaxations. The reason this branching is done is so that the tighter the the smaller the regions, the tighter the convex relaxations are, and hence it is easier to prune the regions and obtain or get closer to the global optimum. And this is like the big picture of uh, uh, the global optimization approach. But this comes with many additional features like how do I come up with local solving techniques or heuristics to be able to get a good local solution? And how do I build a convex relaxation? That itself is a big uh, ongoing research in terms of getting tight relaxations, which is uh, key for good global optimization approaches. How do I partition? And uh, how do we apply the partition pruning scheme for this? regions. So I will basically be talking about how do we build these convex relaxations and a partitioning algorithm, as I won't have much time in this talk, but uh, all these are, are implemented right now in pod. The motivation of uh, this entire approach was from actually the power system uh, applications which we were looking at. So for most of the non-convex ACOPF problems, we had observed that uh, these local solvers like IP opt, which are, you know, primal dual interior point methods, do extremely well. Of course, they don't have a guarantee or a certificate of global optimality, but then most of the solutions we were getting were very close to global optimum for the classic OPF instances, unless you have tweaked the objective or you have done something with the instance such that it doesn't work. That is when we started looking at implementing certain methods, these partitioning algorithms, exploiting this fact, which was what exactly the spatial branch and bone methods or the existing methods were immune to in some sense. The idea of the approach is actually fairly simple. So the idea is, Given that domain of that variable which we took, the simple one-dimensional example, if we divide this particular domain of the variable into two halves, and we subdivide this into further equal partitions, these are basically the standard uniform partitioning approach which is applied in the piecewise mill-based methods when people say they are trying to solve the problem for global optimality. By doing this, as we can see, if the domain of the variables are large, you will end up adding a lot of partitions and hence associatedly you'll end up solving either a lot of easy to solve convex optimization problems or depending on if you model end up modeling this as a mill based method it'll be like a disjunctive union of these regions and corresponding to that will be every region will be a binary variable which is something which was the direction which uh, joey and jp were presenting yesterday here instead if we have a feasible solution let's assume that feasible solution is at the origin in this particular case just uh, just a simple example so we thought basically instead of doing this sort of uniform partitioning and then applying a lot of pruning procedures, let's just not partition the entire domain. Instead, just apply the adaptive partitioning scheme where uh, depending on where the local solution is, just take a little region around that solution and every other region of the variable is basically open for a larger convex relaxation instead of partitioning this entire region. This was just a very preliminary idea which we had. And uh, one of the students, she basically implemented and she said, oh, it's working extremely well and, uh, and the solution times were like comparable to Baron and, and we had done nothing much. That's when we knew that there was something, uh, something attractive in this approach. So the main idea was if in the disjunctive union modeling, if in case the solution falls in the small partition, so then corresponding convex relaxation is going to be very tight and hence the load bond is tightened very quickly for these uh, mixed integer linear programs. 
Of course, if the solution doesn't lie inside that region, obviously it's going to be a weak relaxation. And we basically do this sort of a dynamic partitioning. So this dynamic partitioning is guided basically both by the upper bound and the lower bounding solutions. Basically, the idea is to have sparse addition of uh, disjunctions into the problem. So that's the adaptive partitioning idea which we had. If we just do the same thing using disjunctive modeling, it's basically going to be either one of these three regions which are going to be active, depending on which binary variable is active here. If this is one, and it's going to be corresponding convex relaxations, which is going to be active, and hence the uh, tighter lower bounding. So with this idea, let's get into making things a little more concrete. So let's take a simple example with uh, multilinear functions. So right now, we have implemented for mostly only the polynomial constraints, which includes multilinear functions. Let's take just this example. So the idea is, for these individual multilinear functions, we have this lifted variable at the, in, the, in this lifted space. Solving this problem is going to be more like a generic problem and looking at this general form of the min LP, where how do we handle these multilinear functions individually was basically the idea what we were looking at. So, so far we discussed how do we partition, but once we partition, the real next challenge is about the mathematical formulation which models this disjunction. So once we isolate all the multilinear terms, let's look at a simple, just for demonstration, I'll take a bilinear function, but this theory easily, like fairly trivially extends to multilinear functions. So the main takeaway is, given a bilinear function, we can always apply a McCormick relaxation, and we know that it's indeed the convex cell of the function. Uh, and that's the best we can do. And if it is a multilinear function, applying recursive McCormick does not necessarily capture convex cell. And there has been a lot of work of late, uh, especially by John Lee's group, where they are looking at how do you evaluate the volumes based on the hierarchy of recursion of McCormicks. Again, that does not guarantee that that still captures the convex cell. Hence, we were looking at basically the same thing as the extreme point representation of the function, which is basically a simple lambda formulation, which was exactly similar to what uh, Joey had yesterday for piecewise linear functions, where we are looking at any fe feasible point inside, which is the convex combination of these extreme points. So if we look at partitioning this domain, so basically it's going to be piecewise union of these McCormick envelopes. And this piecewise union of McCormick envelopes is going to be Either it's going to be basically one of this red region, and we, or it's going to be the blue region, and there is going to be two shared extreme points between those two, these two regions. And we basically exploit that fact. This is the distinctive union of these two sets. This is just a simple same lambda representation of individual regions. As we can see, those gray circles are the common extreme points. So now, so we can always apply the ballast formulation where you end up having an extended space of variables where you replicate the variables for each of these distinctive unions and we can always write the convex cell of this. But that's an extended space where certainly we observed that it was computationally not great. Extending this idea for multiple uh, pieces, so this is how we build. Since we knew that there are basically these common extreme points which are shared between the polytopes, we just do an exact representation of this particular distinctive union as a grid. And once we have this sort of a grid, now assume that I have partitioned both the variables, which is a bivariate partitioning, where each of these points are the extreme points of this McCormick envelope. So depending on which binary variable is active, it's going to be that particular grid which is active. So this basically captures a succinct way to represent what are the shared points between these regions. So once we have this, we develop this uh, SOS2 type constraint. So here, the idea of this SOS2 type constraint is again, if this is the binary variable Z1 and Z2, those are basically the two columns which are active. The main idea is, again, it's trying to extend the piecewise linear function ideas, but by taking the entire tower which stands above that particular intersection region. So these are basically the SOS2 type constraints, and I don't really have much to explain other than just showing the bunch of equations to you, but uh, all I can show is some important results after this. So this is one type of constraints which captures the convex hull in the extended space, but not in the projected space, then it is exactly what uh, it's called as a locally shared formulation. Coming to the facet constraints, this is a very interesting one. So this is basically where we looked at deriving the facet constraints and it was not straightforward. So we had to basically sit and play around with this, uh, looking at the structure. And uh, as you can see, the number of binary variables which are shared between the two partitions are going to get added and also the number of lambda variables are also getting added. So the space of lambdas is becoming denser for each of the constraints and this is how the constraints grow. So this is a nice representation for a bilinear function and this is a very straightforward extendable to a multilinear function 
as all we have to look at is in those higher dimensions, the corresponding columns which are shared between these partitions and basically add these column constraints. Theoretical property of these formulations, Joey gave a very nice introduction yesterday, but then I don't want to get into the details, but we basically prove that this formulation F2 is also locally ideal, which captures the convex hull in the space of its projected polytope, and formulation F1 does not capture the convex hull, which is also locally sharp. What does locally sharp mean? So locally sharp is, it has extreme integral points in the, in the extended space of lambdas and the lifted variables, but there is no guarantee that it indeed has the extreme points which are integral when you project back to the original space of variables of the multilinear functions. Okay. Ideally, we would like a locally ideal formulation which has nice theoretical properties, but then computationally, it just so happens that the SOS2 constraints are much better uh, than these ideal constraints. But we have implemented both the formulations in pod, and it is just a matter of choosing which formulation you want to run. Let's get into the actual solver aspect. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay, excellent. That's good. All right, so these formulations and uh, the partitioning algorithms in combination with a bunch of bound propagation ideas and uh, some uh, optimality-based bound tightening. These are all different features which I did not necessarily get to discuss, but are all basically embedded in the solver pod. And uh, why do we call it pod? Because it's uh, a piecewise convex relaxation, and we auto-approximate when we see that functions are convex, and we do this disk dynamic discretization, so that's pod. Okay, so this is, uh, again, you know, a typical Julia package where the number of lines of code are hardly 2,000 lines. Sorry. And adding the package is very simple. And all it needs is a NLP or a MinLP or a local MinLP solver, like Bonman or IPOPT or KNITRO, for instance, and uh, mixed integer linear programming solver. The better the solver, the faster the uh, pod run times are going to be. So if you use Groby or Cplex, it's going to be much better. What have we so far implemented? Basically, we have implemented whatever you saw in terms of formulation so far, and uh, it can handle polynomial problems uh, as of now. We are looking at extending to different kinds of functions like logarithmic and transcendental functions, but we haven't worked on it yet. We have some ideas, but it's in the progress. And uh, these are the piecewise convex relaxations which I presented today is what is implemented right now in pod. We also implement the sequential OBBT. This has been observed to be extremely powerful for some of the applications like optimal power flow problems where uh, Hassan and uh, Sir Carlton have observed uh, very nice results using that. We also observe very similar interesting results for the like, generic MinLP sort of MinLP lib and uh, you don't even have to do branching for many instances and just apply this OBBT and uh, you can get the problem done. So if in case if you have some problem with the convex relaxation, all you want to do is just bound tightening and look at what the best lower bound you can obtain by doing this sort of an OBBT approach, you can use pod. You don't even have to use it for the branching approach. And, uh, you can just switch off the branching option in one of the solver options. And we have the basic convexity detection in pro rules, which are implemented like simple quadratic SOC constraints, but uh, nothing too fancy. And we also have polyhedral outer approximation for convex functions when it recognizes it's convex. We have some automatic parameter tuning. As I was talking about the dynamic variable partitioning, one of the parameters is how do I choose the size of this uh, dynamic partition which I add? And that parameter is what is right now tuned automatically, but it can also be one of the user input options. There are certainly a lot of things which we're working on in terms of constraint propagation rules, and there are, there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting things which can be implemented. But even without all these fancy implementations, the results are very interesting. Uh, let's look at this for a canonical problem which uh, somehow has intrigued the entire uh, MinLP or the NLP literature people. The whole reason this problem is interesting is because of the variable bounds it has. So as you can see, the moment you apply this standard McCormick or the extreme point representation, the lower bounds are super weak. It'll be like 180% away from the up, upper bound, and uh, by the time we close the gap for this instance, it's going to be hard. So as recent as uh, 2016 or even in 2017, there is a paper where people are looking at trying to solve this problem to near global optimality, but within like 1,000 seconds and 600 seconds with their approaches. So let's look at what pod does on this. This is the log of pod. So as you can see, pod is basically fairly smart enough to recognize how many number of variables are involved in nonlinear terms, what are the number of bilinear counts, and these are the subsolvers. Thanks to jump.jl because of which we are able to play around with these solvers and plug in as we want, apply IP op for local solution, apply Groby or Cplex and like, you know, plug and play sort of thing is very convenient with jump. There are a lot of solver configurations which we have right now. 
by default we have tuned it fairly well but then as you can see you'll be able to for instance choose the type of formulation which is SOS2 type in this one which I have added right now but then you can choose the facet formulation and we also have implemented all the McCormick formulations and stuff just to basically play around and see how it works and also we can switch off the pre-solver if we don't want or we can always add them back it also optimality tolerances and number of iterations of your load boarding algorithm so looking at the solutions it takes like seven iterations 12 seconds and we have global optimum for this instance. So this is very interesting because we don't do bound tightening on this instance. We start at those large bounds as you saw in the previous slide. And because of this dynamic partitioning approach plus in combination with the, the formulations which we derived, we are able to reach to global optimum fairly fast and uh, certainly this is way better than most of the state of the art. But Baron certainly does extremely well on this instance because Baron has a lot of cool features in terms of recognizing certain convexity, doing initial bound propagation and uh, uh, stuff like that. So we also have one another option. If you get, for instance, bored with this monotonous black output, we also have a colorful part where it prints the <laughs> solutions in colors. That's just for fun. Uh, one of our students was bored, I guess, and he was uh, implementing. I think I'm almost done. We have run on like multiple multilinear problems and the multi instances which Dr. Sainz just gave us. And we use the most recent version of Baron and we run for one hour. This Venn diagram basically shows that we were able to solve a lot of instances which other solvers could not solve, like QN, Skip, and Baron. Of course, there were some instances which, for instance, QN could solve one instance which we could not solve, or other solvers could not solve. I'm sure this is going to be available online. You can kind of look at it. This is a very interesting plot, which is a performance profile of pod with respect to other global solvers. As you can see, without many features, with just a good formulation and a good algorithm, we are able to almost be as good as Baron, at least the most recent version of Baron, and mostly way better than QIN and SKIP. And these were all mostly the harder instances. So there were a few timed out instances. As you can see here, Baron sometimes didn't even find feasible solutions, or it was the gaps were seriously large. And though we could not converge to globally optimum, pod could at least find solutions which were fairly close to optimum and accept few instances. So this was very interesting because within few iterations of the lower bounding algorithm using these mill-based methods, we could approach uh, close to global optimum solutions. With this, I'll uh, finish and I'll take questions. Thank you.